there are still some seats in the front. Uh, you know, it may be crowded in the back, but there's still seats. In, that's for our Zoom people to let them know. The place is packed, folks. You know. Great to have everyone here at Grace United Methodist Church for our Sunday worship on a very bitter morning. Thank you for being here, especially the choir members. Yeah. I was very surprised to see so many choir members here for rehearsal. I thought it was going to be like a quartet or something today. So we're very glad about that. And we're, we're here to worship God, so it doesn't matter how many folks are here. But glad to see you all. Hello, Zoom folks. And uh, we have two guests here today. We have Eden and we have Marilyn. They're with us, and they are Jan's grandchildren. Right. Grandchildren. Great. <laughs> Stacy said grand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ah, there you go. Well, welcome, ladies. Great to have you here. All right, just a few things. Uh, today, this is Human Relations Day, done in conjunction with uh, Martin Luther King Day uh, tomorrow. And we're taking a special offering. I don't think we did this last year, but we'll do it this year. And it's the first of six annual nationwide uh, special Sundays of the United Methodist Church. And this one supports social justice and outreach ministries. The uh, fund helps encourage the potential through ministries like Community Developers Program, multi-ethnic ministries, and, the, and countless other projects across the United Methodist Connection. So I don't think we have envelopes for those, but if you just on, an, on a pew envelope put human relations, uh, we'll make sure it goes to that. Or you can give online. I just gave online uh, the other day. Len put a, a slot in there for Human Relations Day. So that's a, that's a very easy way to give, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, you'll note that our first hymn, instead of hymn of praise, is hymn of calling, and our final hymn is hymn of righteousness. It's just kind of an, uh, an emphasis on it being uh, Martin Luther King's birthday and Human Relations Day. That we this is one of our uh, primary callings as Christians and especially as United Methodists, and I'll be talking about that in my message. So hymn of calling, we are all called, and hymn of righteousness is not in the sense that, you know, necessarily we are righteous or we're self-righteous, hopefully not, but it's in the sense of righteousness as seen in scripture, uh, right standing with God. And it kind of reflects God's commitment to his covenant. And his covenant includes, of course, all people made in his image. So that is what that is about. All right, stop playing with the cross. Um, our choir is here today, as we just mentioned. We have a missions moment by Kathy Pearson. We'll be doing that in a second. Uh, today at 3 p.m., there's a Martin Luther King celebration at um, St. Mark's on Lawrence Street. There are flyers in the narthex if you want to pick up one. Um, so check that out. And then after church, we're having a new session of Beyond Trivia, Beyond Coffee. And today it's going to be on trivia. So it'll be the baby boomers versus the millennials. So we're going to stamp those kids out. No, I'm just kidding. So it, it should be real fun. I always enjoy trivia stuff, so uh, please uh, plan to uh, stay. Let's see. Uh, Lake District training is on the 27th of January. These are always really good sessions. You don't have to be a part of any committee to go. They're very informative, um, very well done. So consider that. Uh, the church council would remind us that we can all attend church council meetings. And our first one for the year is going to be on February 11th. And uh, we'll have our, as we've done sometimes with uh, like the um, uh, visioning thing, we just have our fellowship time and then we get into the uh, program, the meeting. And uh, we're trying to promise not to go beyond an hour. So we can still get you out um, in, uh, in good time. And then, uh, oh, one thing I forgot, on the 28th Sunday, we'll be having New Members Sunday. We'll be welcoming new members into the congregation. So it's always nice to be here for that. 
And I believe that is it. So, uh, Kathy, if you would. Give Good morning. Us Good morning. There. So, you will find in your bulletin two articles. <clears throat> and one is titled Abundant Generosity, and the second is Super Bowl Food Drive. Both of these articles relate to the North Chicago Community Partners Food Pantry housed at North Chicago High School. North Chicago Community Partners is committed to helping the students of North Chicago schools. The food pantry is just one example of its support. The hygiene items and food items that you continue to provide through your donations improve the lives of students and their families. Grace is the only institution that is a reliable, timely source for hygiene items. Lois Nickel, Jan Karowski, and Stacy Gustafero volunteer to restock the shelves. Often when they arrive, the hygiene shelves are empty. And even though, the even though the clients are limited to only three items. After Jan and Lois delivered Grace's bounty, the shelves were full. To try to keep them full, members of Say Grace make a monthly delivery to the food pantry. These items are either purchased with money given to Say Grace or the actual items donated. The fourth Sunday of each month has been designated as the day to bring your donations, but you can always bring them at your convenience. Families depend on us. Now the second article, Stacy always finds a way to make essential food drives fun. And this year we can choose between our favorite teams or conference. I have to figure out which conference my favorite team is in once I figure out who my favorite team is, <laughs> since I'm a bit of a fair weather fan. And if you really don't care about football, but you care about food insecurity, there is an I don't care about football box. Thank you again for your generosity and Grace's ongoing relationship with our neighbors in North Chicago. Thanks. After the peace of Christ, please remain standing. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ, Linda. Peace of Christ. 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 Peace of Christ, Robert. Peace of Christ, George. Peace of Christ, you guys. Peace of Christ. Excellent. Please remain standing for our call to worship. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. It was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Please remain standing for our hymn of calling, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Soldiers of Christ Arise Put your armor on, strong in the strength which God applied through his eternal Son, strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trust is more than conqueror. 
please join me in the opening prayer. God of all people, you spoke through your prophet, saying, let justice roll down like waters. Is it different? Call to call us and to bring in Christ those who have been lost. In the name of the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. Okay. You may be seated. Our scripture reading today comes from Philemon verses 8 to 17. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man and now as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you welcome me. Our gospel reading for today comes from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was, one, was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Good morning, peoples. <laughs> well, we come together now to share our joys and concerns and to pray together. Uh, our concerns are what they uh, have been. Uh, Leanna's mom is uh, still working through her shingles. And um, I just learned today that um, Leanna's brother lives with her mom. So uh, she has someone there right at home uh, caring for. Her. Uh, continuing with Ernie, I'm gonna try to go to see Ernie uh, this week. I haven't heard from them in a while. And of course, we want to continue to pray for Nancy's brother, Mark, and for Jim, and for Mark Andell in their battles with uh, cancer. What joys and concerns do you have today? Tom Grant. 
better half watching on Zoom, I think. So anyway, she celebrated a big birthday yesterday. Which one? Oh, yeah, well, okay, yeah, okay. It's a just, a big one. One. just a big one. Just a big one. Okay. So happy birthday, Anne. Who else? Anybody else? Can you enjoy your concern? All right. Let's pray together. On this Human Relations Day and on the eve of celebrating Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, we come to you, Lord, thinking of those in need and those being treated unjustly. Hear our prayers. We pray for the leaders of governments and influential organizations that they look to you for guidance and to make our nation and our communities a refuge for the marginalized and a place for all to be treated equally and with respect. Give these leaders the resolve to fight poverty, hunger, disease, and all manner of human suffering. Give them a vision for shaping a world where self-interest is tempered and corrected by love and compassion. Lord, direct us in following you, how we ought to live for you and serve you and our neighbor in these days amidst so much need. You have drawn us into this congregation to be nurtured and to work together, offering encouragement and giving others a response to your, uh, as we give response to your great provision. We are grateful that you enrich us with the gifts of your spirit and the resources for fulfilling our mission as Jesus' disciples. Illumine our paths in showing us how we can best serve those around us with acts of compassion and acts of justice. Help us to make your kingdom a reality here in Lake Bluff. God of mercy, we pray for all who are sick or hurting or grieving. Bring rest to weary hearts, bring peace to troubled minds, bring joy to all in the midst of their pain. We also ask that you lift up and energize caregivers so loyal and dedicated in tending to loved ones and friends. And Lord, we bring you our own joys and concerns. Lord, we continue to pray for Georgia and for Ernie and for Mark and Jim and Mark Gandell. Lord, continue to be with them and help them to recover and heal and progress in their given situations. And we're so very thankful for Anne celebrating a big birthday. We are grateful for her and all that she does for the church and our community. And uh, we just uh, really miss her today. Happy birthday, Anne. Lord, give us the vision of Martin Luther King and others who speak up for the folks with no voice for, and those for whom justice and equality is an unfulfilled promise. Make those priorities our priorities and draw us to the one who showed us how to live for you your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now receive your tithes and gifts.
these gifts to help us and others who fight for your justice and care for the poor better as Jesus did. In his name we pray. Amen. song. Do you like it? I think it's really great. Kind of taken from Micah 6, walk humbly with your Lord and so forth. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, open our ears to the truth of your word, that the testimony of Christ may be strengthened among us, that our hearts be filled with the desire to proclaim your justice. Amen. John Wesley lay on his deathbed at the age of 88. The founder of Methodism had dedicated his entire life to calling the Church of England, of which he was an ordained priest, back to the early church's original mission. He called people to live as the New Testament described the Christian life, imitating the example of Christ and following his teachings. So on his deathbed, what preoccupied the mind of this great leader who founded an amazingly successful movement that caught fire across the British Isles and later even more so in the then infant United States? As he knew he was at the end of his earthly life, what was he concerned about? The continuing growth of the root movement, finances, succession of leadership? No, it was slavery. Written on February 24th, 1791, six days before his death, Wesley's last letter was addressed to William Wilberforce, the great English member of parliament and abolitionist. Here in part is what Wesley wrote. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing in the extinction of slavery, 
you will be born worn out by the opposition of men and devils but if god is for you who can be against you are all of them stronger than god oh be not weary of well-doing go on in the name of god and in the power of his might till even american slavery the vilest that has ever been done shall vanish away before it that he who has guided you from youth up may continue to strengthen you in this and all things is the prayer of dear sir your affectionate servant john wesley i was fascinated to learn that wesley's last correspondence was a word of encouragement to a man who led the abolition movement in England, and many times he stood alone. This may surprise many because Wesley is often cast as being focused entirely on personal holiness. We talk about the means of grace being the sacraments and prayer and reading and meditating on scripture, fasting, worship, etc. But that's only half of the story. All of what I just listed, Wesley considered works of piety, acts of devotion, inwardly focused, and acts of worship, outwardly focused. The other side of the means of grace or the way God works in a believer's life, Wesley referred to as works of mercy. Doing good works, visiting the sick and prisoners, feeding the hungry, giving generously, and seeking justice. Why did Wesley emphasize both works and piety and piety and works of works of piety and works of mercy? Because to Wesley, Jesus' two greatest commandments are what the Christian life is all about. You've heard me say it several times before. Love the Lord your God, expressed in acts of piety, God focused. Love your neighbor as yourself, expressed in acts of mercy, focused outwardly on others. According to Wesley, who would say, according to Jesus, you are not living the Christian life as it should be lived unless both acts of piety and acts of mercy are part of your spiritual walk. And most of us understand that. The church does not perform acts of piety, uh, so this church does not just perform acts of piety, we also do good works, feed the hungry, give generously. I do not know if any of us visit prisoners in, in, uh, in jail or in prison, but I know we do visit folks who are sick and homebound and are in need. But all of those things, feeding the hungry, visiting the sick, giving generously, are acts of compassion. None of them is an act of justice. What's the difference? Well, I once heard a professor, Garrett, say, an act of compassion is feeding the hungry. An act of justice is asking why that person is hungry in the first place and doing something about it. We hear this call for justice clearly in the Old Testament, particularly in the prophets. Read through those spokespeople for God and note how many times God's people are called to act justly. And they are warned that they will be judged if they do not do so, especially in relation to the most vulnerable people in their society and ours today. Those with no power to do anything about the injustice perpetrated against them. The prophet Amos proclaims that God does not want our worship if we are not living for justice. I hate, I despise your religious feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Justice is all about giving a person 
or persons or some other entity their, uh, their uh, own due. As one writer states, justice seeks for, for life for everyone in the community because life for everyone, because, uh, because life is for everyone, justice pays particular attention to the people denied life. Justice provides for access by all to the command communal good life. None can justly prosper at the expense of others or even in the light of the poverty and need of others. Amos sees justice as part of the created order, giving each individual his or her due in light of being made in the image of God. Another commentator states, because all people share in the image of God, they have dignity and value, discrimination and disregard for any human life can thus never be justified. Injustice severs relationship. Justice establishes or restores relationships. Relationships. Which brings us to our passage today. Paul's letter to Philemon is one of the shortest books in the Bible, only 25 verses. Many of Paul's writings are written to churches. The first time Romans or Ephesians or Philippians was presented, someone read it out loud to an entire church in Rome, in Ephesus, in Philippi, etc. There are a few of Paul's letters that are written to individuals with the understanding that the letters would be copied and shared with a wide audience such as 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, giving instruction to church leaders. But Philemon is unique. It is focused on a personal matter. You could read it as a private letter, even though it is addressed to three people and a house church to which they belong. But this personal matter has universal implications and speaks to us in crystal clear terms, 2,000 years later. Philemon owns a slave named Onesimus who has run away. We assume from the context that Onesimus has done something to anger Philemon and the slave fears retribution or more retribution. Onesimus runs to Paul who is in prison the slave must know that Philemon respects Paul a great deal, so perhaps Paul will intercede on behalf of Onesimus. Paul's approach to the situation is wise and very clever. He proposes a solution through which Onesimus, but especially Philemon, will grow in their walk with Christ. Paul has given instruction on the teachings of Jesus who, would Jesus, who would find it repulsive to own any human being. Jesus talks about being a slave in service to others, but it is always in terms of voluntary service, never coerced. However, in the first century AD, slavery played a major role in Greco-Roman culture. Some slaves were treated, as we understand much of the institution, of slavery in the United States, owned as property, treated horribly with no rights, suppressed with little hope of ever being free. But many in the ancient world were treated as trusted servants and in several contexts had the opportunity to earn their freedom. There were many believers in the early church who were slaves. Several people Paul mentions in his letters have slave names. Many churches raised funds to buy the freedom of slaves. We know that some early Christians, get this, even sold themselves into temporary slavery to provide financing for the work of the church. How would you like to chair that stewardship campaign? <laughs> In practical terms, most slaves could do very little to change their station in life, but many in the church took a stand against slaveholders. While most of the early church did not call for abolition, 
which would have thrown the Roman Empire into anarchy. Christians, based on Jesus' teachings, put pressure on slave owners who became believers to free their slaves, on slave, uh, free their slaves, or as an intermediary step, at least treat them as they would treat family members and friends. Here, Paul says he could claim his apostolic authority and order Philemon to welcome back Onesimus. Onesimus without repercussions or even free Onesimus. But instead, he is going to send Onesimus back to Philemon, and Paul appeals to him on the basis of love to act as he should act as a true believer, to be reconciled with Onesimus, and to begin seeing him in a different light, and hopefully to grant him his freedom. Paul does not appeal to his authority over Philemon or over Onesimus, but to his personal relationships with Philemon and Onesimus. Paul says that he has become a father to Onesimus, that Philemon should treat him no longer as a slave, but as a beloved brother. And that Philemon should welcome Onesimus as he would welcome Paul, Philemon's spiritual father. The apostle says that if this slave has wronged Philemon in any way or owes him anything, that debt should be charged to Paul's account. And Philemon, who came to Christ under Paul's preaching and teaching, owes a great debt to Paul. Charge it to my account, which you know has a substantial credit. Finally, Paul is always very practical about these things. He tells my layman, oh, one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me. Paul is going to pay my layman a visit to see if he has done his Christian duty in love relationships. The Old Testament especially does not treat justice primarily as a legal concept the way we think of it most often today. The concept of justice tends to merge with steadfast love, compassion, kindness, salvation. One writer states, justice has to do with how a loving creator has made the world to be just means to live according to the Creator's will, to be in harmony with God, with fellow human beings, with the rest of creation, and not rest until everyone else finds such harmony. Relationships. I am always moved when I read John Wesley's account of his conversion experience as someone was reading the preface to Martin Luther's commentary on the Book of Romans, during a meeting in Aldersgate, Wesley writes, while he was describing the change which God works in the human, in the heart, through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins. He shares this experience with his brother Charles, who says that he had a similar spiritual awakening a few days before. And the first thing the Wesley brothers do after these experiences of God's grace, they go to a prison to minister to those with little hope, establishing relationships with those they would not normally encounter in their daily lives. My layman is not our official epistle lectionary this week, but I chose it for Human Relations Day to emphasize how we can make justice a reality, how we can help each individual attain his or her due. We could never do it by waving placards and yelling at each other with vitriolic condemning rhetoric. You can do it only through loving relationships. 
We build relationships by getting out and meeting people, making connections. I hate to use the by now cliche to term networking, but we need to start networking or continuing to work with others. In the midst of all the divisiveness in the world today, there is a hunger for unity, for sharing things in common, for breaking down barriers and building bridges. You can feel it. That desire comes from the Holy Spirit who drives us to make these connections. At the beginning of a new year, let us commit ourselves to satisfying that hunger. Amen. Will you stand, please? trivia game after uh, the service here during fellowship time. Go forth working for justice and building relationships one person at a time that leads to a just world. And may God's steadfast love and mercy lead you and make your steps secure, keeping you forever safe on paths of righteousness and peace. Amen. Amen.